Well, this morning, uh, I am doing something a little bit differently. I know that in the Gospel Project that we were looking at John, we were going to be in the Gospel of John and talking about how Jesus is the gate. And that is an excellent passage today. That is a very important passage, but I'm not going to be doing that today. I am stepping a little bit away from the Gospel Project. However, Uh, The sermon today is in the same vein as the Gospel Project, so we're not going too far off the reservation, more like just a little bit of of a detour, if you will. Today's focus is Jesus as Lord of the Sabbath. You'll remember as we've been going through the Gospel Project, we've been looking at Jesus as Messiah. We've seen various aspects of this, how we've seen how Jesus is the second Adam, how Jesus is the final Adam, if you will. We've seen how Jesus is the true light, how Jesus is the one who is the one who brings us life. We've seen how Jesus is the bread of life. And of course, most recently, we've been looking at discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ, being salt and light, being good stewards of what God has given us, as we saw uh, last week, and of course, not storing up treasures here on earth, but instead storing up treasures in heaven. And so to this idea, we're going to be focused on Jesus as Lord of the Sabbath. We're going to be looking at the Sabbath. What does it mean that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath? And now, the reason why I'm doing this is, is twofold. I, have, I had two things that happened this week that really compelled me to step away from the Gospel Project and instead uh, preach this message today. Two things that had happened this week. Um, not the, the first thing, but one thing that happened is I, I received a question from a member. And they were asking, this member was asking, uh, what do we do about the Sabbath? Uh, The Jews held the Sabbath on Saturday. The Sabbath was to be honored on the seventh day of the week. And, of course, we know that the seventh day of the week is not Sunday, but it's Saturday. So why is it that believers hold church on Sunday? And, of course, it seems like in a lot of ways we tend to ignore the Sabbath, that we don't honor the Sabbath. Is it still a requirement for believers to keep the Sabbath, because we've been recognizing, if you've been looking at the Wednesday night Bible study, you notice that I've made it very important in going through the psalm that uh, the Christians should still recognize God's law, that God's law does still have a place in the believer's life. We've looked at the different uses of the law, how the first purpose of the law, of course, is to show us our sin. It is to show us our need by presenting God's standard of righteousness, of holiness. The law shows us how we have failed to keep that standard. And of course, then we've looked at the third use of the law, that when we do believe in Christ, when we are trusting in him, that third use of the law then shows us how we are to live because the law is a reflection, or at least the moral law, if you will, the Ten Commandments, that is a reflection of God's divine character. God's character is revealed in the law that he gives, right? So, for example, in the very first commandment, you shall have no gods before me. The attribute of God that is expressed in that commandment is God's absolute sovereignty. God is above everything. God is over everything. He is set apart, elevated above. There is nothing above God. Ergo, you are to have no gods. You are to worship nothing above God because there is nothing above God. You see how the law is an expression of various attributes and the character of God. And so in this way, we had the question arised about the Sabbath. Should we still keep the Sabbath? And why then do we not keep it on Saturday? There are uh, some sects that do. There's a group called Seventh-day Adventists. This is somewhat where they get their name to where they do honor the Sabbath. They believe very much that the Old Testament covenant, very much of the Mosaic covenant, uh, is the Christians must strictly abide by that. And partly what they do is, of course, again, they don't do anything from from Friday, sundown Friday, to uh, the sundown on Saturday. I had a friend... Um, in high school, and we played basketball, he, would, he was a Seventh-day Adventist, and he never played a basketball game if we had it on Friday night. It stunk because he was one of the best players on the team. So every Friday night, he wasn't there, and we generally would lose um, if he wasn't playing with us. So we always remember that. But I remember him, uh, us talking about that a little bit. And so that was the first thing that really made me want to address this because I kind of was able to address it in the moment But I wasn't able to address it as perhaps fully as I wanted to. And so I wanted to preach on that because I figured if one person had that question, it's likelihood that others do too. 
And I hope you don't think that I'm yelling at you. I just am trying to speak loudly enough, so please don't take my volume as if I'm yelling. Uh, But the second thing that happened was this. I I, I saw one of those Facebook posts, um, a meme, if you will, where it's essentially the the white words on a a color background, you know, and it's supposed to be saying something profound, and essentially it said something like this. Uh, You work for about 60 years of your life, then you get about 15 years of doing what you want, and then you die. Does nobody else see how messed up this is? And the idea that was expressed in this this, uh, Facebook post that I had seen a few people shared, I had seen it a couple of times before that, was essentially what? It seems to be a tragedy that you work your whole life, you only get to rest for a little bit, and then you die. That that's, that's somehow not right, that that's a bad way of living. And it occurred to me that very often in our culture, what we're seeing around us is a misunderstanding of work. And in fact, we need to reclaim a theology of work. You see, both the Sabbath and work were things that were talked about before the fall of man. If you go all the way back to Genesis, when God creates Adam and Eve, God places Adam in the garden to work it. This is in paradise. So work was a part of unfallen creation. The idea that work is somehow bad, that it is a bad thing for us to do at its core, is not biblical. In the same way, of course, we see that the origin of the Sabbath is in Genesis. Right after God completes, finishes creation, He finishes making the world, He ceases with creation. It says that on the sixth day He created man, on the seventh day He had finished creation and He rested And so then God sanctified, or He set apart that day, and as John MacArthur points out, that He sanctified in this sense doesn't just mean that it's separated, it also means that it is elevated. He elevates this day of honoring the completion of creation. And of course, this this then comes to the book of Exodus when Moses is giving the commands, and you see in the fourth commandment, Where God tells the people of Israel, six days are you to work, but on the seventh day you shall do no work. That is a day that God has sanctified or he has set apart. And so on six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall not work. And this brings us here to Jesus and what we're going to see with Jesus' reaction or interaction, if you will, with the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees in the passage that we're going to look at They think that Jesus' disciples have broken this command of keeping the Sabbath. So if you have your Bibles, please open them now to Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. We are going to be in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Matthew chapter 12. And we're looking at Jesus as Lord of the Sabbath. And we're going to be focusing on what the Sabbath is, what's its purpose, as well as um, the a theology of work as well. And of course, what is Jesus' role and what is the believer's role with the Sabbath as well. So we are in Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priest? Or have you not read in the law how the Sabbath how, excuse me, how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Father, I pray that you be with me now as I preach to your people, God. Calm my mind, Lord. There's so many things racing right now, God. Let me be focused upon your word. Let me be faithful as well, God. As I speak to your people, let me not feed them the opinions of Thomas, 
but let me feed them your word. Father, I pray for your people. They will hear it, they will think on it, that they will meditate on it, that it will go with them outside this building, Lord, that it will follow them to their homes, that it will come out in their very actions, Lord. May your people feed on your word this day. May it be nourishment for them spiritually, God. Lord, we know that you will do this by your spirit, God, so I pray by your spirit, give my sermon power this day for your people. May I glorify you, Lord, in respecting the text. May I glorify you in respecting your people, God. May you be glorified and your church receiving your word. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So again, we do see here at the word of God that as Jesus is passing through the grain fields, his disciples are hungry, and they take some of the grain and they begin to pluck it and eat it. We also see this account in the book of in the Gospel of Mark, in the Gospel of Mark toward the end of chapter 2, we see the same account. And the Pharisees are following Jesus and they're watching and they think, ah, we can't get anything on Christ. Let's get something on their disciples. Because oftentimes what? A man is, his man's disciples is a reflection upon himself. He says, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful. Now the truth is, though, is that what the disciples were doing was completely acceptable. You see, the way that the Sabbath worked out in the Old Testament was that you could not go and reap from the fields in terms of what you would regularly do throughout the day if you were a farmer. If you were a farmer, you could not reap from the fields on the Sabbath. The idea, of course, is what do farmers do? Typically, they are reaping from their fields so that way they can get what they will eat and then what they will also sell to other people. But the disciples, they're not farmers, And the land that they're passing through is not their land. Now you say, well, are they stealing? No, right? There was another part of the law that said that those who owned lands could only harvest towards close to the end. They couldn't harvest the whole field. They'd have to basically get about 95% of it, and then they'd have to leave that last 5% for anybody who wanted to wander through and needed something to eat. They could eat from that unharvested grain. This is in the case of the disciples. As they were coming through, they were plucking from this unharvested grain, again, that was there specifically for them to eat. The Old Testament covenant also made sure to point out that if you needed to do something in order to stay alive, that that was lawful on the Sabbath. One thing that's not here but is in Mark's account is what Jesus says to the Pharisees. Jesus says that the Sabbath was not made for, or excuse me, man was not made for the Sabbath's benefit, but Sabbath was made for the man. And in this, Jesus is pointing to the spirit of the Sabbath. And I I point this out here, and I also point it out to to show you how the disciples were not breaking the Sabbath law according to the letter of the law, because it seems like many times the way that we try to present it is that Jesus cared about the spirit of the law, but the Pharisees cared about the letter of the law. That's not, that's a sort of a false dichotomy. The truth is, is that Jesus cared about the true spirit of the law. He knew what the law actually was, what its purpose was, because he was the originator of the law. And because he understood the true spirit of the law, he followed the letter of the law according to the actual spirit. The Pharisees didn't do this. The Pharisees didn't think about, they didn't understand the law in that way. They took the law, and rather the law being about life, and rather it being a recognition of God's holiness, and again, God giving life, the Pharisees instead took the law and used that as an opportunity to glorify themselves. As such, they would constantly misrepresent the law, and they would in fact add burdens onto the law. This is one of the ways that you know that somebody is being legalistic rather than trying to actually honor God's word. It is when they are not following it, but they've interpreted it in a particular way, ultimately in a way that is self-glorifying, and then they add to that law. In this instance here, the Pharisees are saying, okay, the Sabbath is about how well I can rest to honor God. 
rather than the Sabbath being a gift of rest to man from God, recognizing that God has established this pattern of you work six days and then you rest and then you work six days and then you rest, that pattern of life because we need rest but we also need to work. The Pharisees took it and they made it all about themselves. And in so doing, they then added to it, well, if it honors God for the farmer not to harvest this field, well, they must really honor God if nobody harvested their field. And so then they say to the disciples, what they're doing is unlawful because they had misinterpreted, they had missed the purpose of the law. And so doing here, we're going to talk about that as well. I mentioned it briefly with the, the, the Sabbath and the purpose of the Sabbath, how God had established this pattern Six days you will work, and on the seventh day you will rest. And we see as we look in Genesis and as we see in Exodus where the law is given, what is the purpose of it here? Again, John MacArthur had a great sermon on this, so I'm going to be pulling from, but I'd encourage you to go and listen to his sermon. But he talked about how the Scriptures make it very clear that in this the Sabbath is doing a couple of things. Number one, it is a celebration of creation. This is one of the reasons why God rested on the seventh day. It's not that God was tired and that God needed to rest to restore his strength. But instead, what was God doing? God was resting in the sense that he was enjoying now what he had created. He had ceased creating. The creation was finished. And now on the seventh day, he was resting, enjoying his creation, communing with his creation. And so on the Sabbath day, when we are resting, we rest to celebrate, to recognize God's communion with us. And to put it like this, the idea of what God's doing, it's sort of like when you get through uh, doing, as a man, if you're a woman, even if you're doing some yard work, it's that moment to where when you finally finish doing all the yard work and then you step back and you look at that house that you just got through. You, got, you get through looking at all of the bushes. You get through looking at all the stuff that you've picked up. You're finally done. And you're looking at the job that you're done. You're like, ah, and you're just enjoying it. That's what God was doing on the seventh day. He was enjoying the creation that he had made. And so one purpose of the Sabbath there is to remind humanity of the created, of what that they were created, of the fact that God had created them. Another purpose of the Sabbath, though, has to do with work. As I said, God created man to work in the garden. Work is a good thing. It seems like nowadays, because uh, we, we have a misunderstanding of work, and we seem to take work in two different ways. And I'll explain why after I explain how we do it. Some people take work and they corrupt it in this way. They say that work is all about what I can gain for myself. And so they are constantly working and working and working because enough is never enough for them. They always need more things. It's about earning this next achievement for yourself. It's about accomplishing this next thing. And the work is all about how to glorify oneself. It does not trust in God's provision. It does not work towards God's glory. This is somebody who does not know how to stop working. Maybe you are this way. Maybe you are what they would call a workaholic. You can never stop working because your work is for your own self-satisfaction, your own self-righteousness. That's not biblical. That's sinful. That is a sinful aspect of work. There's another way, though, that we can sin in regards to work, and that is that we can disengage from work. Notice the two extremes here. This one extreme is I've got to work all the time. I've got to be constantly achieving this and achieving this and achieving this for my glory, not God's. The other aspect is where laziness comes from. It's to disengage from work. Even if you do bother to work, you're thinking about when you're resting. And your whole life is trying to work just hard enough so then you can rest. You're not striving for God's glory in your work. You're working just enough to where you can feel the pleasure and enjoyment of relaxation. If you want to see two great examples of this, you can look at the boomer generation which is an example of workaholics, of always trying to work to accomplish things for their own glory. I think that that's very much representative of the boomer generation in the United States. And if you want to see the opposite, look at the millennial generation. The millennial generation saw the way that their parents acted and their grandparents acted, and they responded differently. 
And so now the sin of laziness manifests within millennials. And so you've seen these two generations, both of whom are not approaching work in a biblical, God-honoring way. This is a result of the fall. Part of the fall, when Adam sinned against God, God cursed the world. And he said, by the sweat of your brow will you work. Thorns and thistle will the earth produce for you. Work, rather than being something good, became something bitter. It became very hard. And so the Sabbath does is the Sabbath is also a recognition that God had created the world, but now it is in a state of fallenness because now you have to rest. Whereas before you could work and it wouldn't just drain you like work often does. It would not drain you of energy in the same way that it did before. Now when you work, now that work is hard. Now it is tough. Now it is by the sweat of your brow, by the blistering of your hands. And so the Sabbath is also a reminder of how we had lost that paradise. But it is also God's grace in providing that moment of rest for us. Of showing us that we do need this time to rest. To stop what we are doing. And it gives us an opportunity to commune with God. And of course it points us to something greater. Which I'm going to get to as we complete the text. And so Jesus understands all of this. He understands the true purpose of work. He understands the true purpose of Sabbath. How it is a celebration of God completing creation. How it is a reminder of how through sin we have lost that perfect creation. And now we exist where we have to work hard. Where we have to work by the sweat of our brow. It is a representation of God's grace. Of God giving us life. And so that is His purpose is to help give us life. Because that was the purpose of God's law. God's law is life-giving because God is the giver of life. And so his law is a reflection of that. This is why we deserve death when we break God's law. is because we are denying that which gives us life. And so with all of that, then he responds to the Pharisees. He says, verse 3. Have you not read, so he directs them to the scriptures... Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of presence, or ate the showbread. Again, in the temple there was this bread, it was called the showbread, or the bread of presence. And the only people who were supposed to eat this bread normally were the priests. It really, under normal circumstances, it was not lawful for David or for his followers to eat it. But because they were about to die of hunger... They ate the bread and it was not counted against them. Why? Because God's law is ultimately about giving life. God's law was made for us. God giving His law to the people of Israel was not to further burden them, was not to weigh them down, it was to be an act of grace. Now again, this is where sin comes in, right? Right? Sin twists the law, it distorts it. Sin takes what God gives that's good and twists it and makes it a burden. This is what Paul talks about in Romans, how he says when the law comes, sin also entered. And sin corrupts it from within us and produces all kinds of disobedience within us. But Jesus points here, points them here how for the sake of life, it's okay that David could eat the bread. And then he further points them in verse 5. He says, Or have you not read how the law of the Sabbath, how the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath, right? Every Sabbath the priests are working in the temple. But yet they're guiltless. Why? Because the priests are working to the glory of God. Because the priests are there performing the sacrifices. The priests are there praying for the people. The priests are there giving the sense of the word of God. They are working. They are doing their purpose. But what? It is for the life of the people of Israel that they may commune with God. That they may perform the necessary sacrifices. And so because they are doing that which honors and glorifies God... They're not violating the law of the Sabbath. It's pointing to how this law was given for a purpose. He's showing how the Pharisees had misunderstood it. 
But here's where it becomes particularly relevant in verse 7. Or excuse me, verse 6. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. What's he talking about? He's talking about himself. He's saying, look, the Pharisees, they can violate the Sabbath because they are honoring God in the temple. But I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. The true temple. The true way in which we are brought with reconciliation in God, that being Jesus Christ. And he says this, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. In the sense that he's referring to the law of God, how God's law is about life and it is about giving life. It is not about burdening you. It is about how in keeping God's law, it is about the condition of our heart. Are we honoring God in our heart? It is not just meaningless ritual. Then you would not have condemned the guiltless. And in so doing, he points out how his disciples are guiltless. They had not broken the law. The Pharisees, because of their self-righteousness, because of their own traditions, had condemned those who were guiltless. And then in verse 8 he says, For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now what does that mean? And we even sang about that today, did we not? And the special, a mighty fortress is our God, verse 2. You ask who that might be, Christ Jesus, it is He. Lord Sabbath is His name. That's where Martin Luther is pulling from. He's pulling from this passage here, or in Mark where it says, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. What does that mean? That means that Christ is sovereign over the Sabbath. When Jesus says Son of Man here, He is pulling from Daniel 7, where Daniel has that vision of the Son of Man who is seated at the right hand of the Father, who is given authority and sovereignty over the earth. Christ is Lord of the Sabbath. And guess what the Lord of the Sabbath can do? He can abrogate the Sabbath if He wants. And there are times in the scripture to where God does do that. When did the Israelites take Jericho? During the Sabbath. The Israelites worked and took the Sabbath, or excuse me, took the city of Jericho on the Sabbath after God had already established it. But God abrogated the law in this instance. And he can do that because he has the authority. And Jesus has the authority to do this here. And so now we're getting to the kind of the question, right? Some of you might remember the question, why do we worship on Sunday as opposed to Saturday? And what are we to do with the Sabbath? We see here that throughout Jesus' ministry that He is fulfilling all of the Old Testament laws. He is the fulfillment of the law. He fulfills every aspect. And this is why it's important that we recognize that His disciples did not break the law. Not even the letter of the law. Jesus fulfills it in its entirety. Including this idea of keeping the Sabbath. And you see, for the believer, when we believe in Christ, we find our true rest in Him. He is our Sabbath. Does He not say that? Come to me, all you who are weak and weary, and I will give you what? Rest. All of our working, all of our striving, we are to rest in Christ. This is why we do not work for our salvation. We do not earn our salvation, but what? We rest in the completed work of of Christ, who has fulfilled the law in its entirety in our place. And this is why we worship God on the Lord's Day, as John makes reference to in the book of Revelation, on Sunday, the day that He rose up from the grave. The day that He showed that He had authority to be our rest. He died on the cross, and if He had stayed dead, we would still be in our sins. But because He rose up, because He was alive, it showed that the sacrifice had been accepted, that death itself had been reversed, and that this 
Jesus is the Christ. He is God's anointed. He can give you rest. He can give you salvation. So you come to him through faith. You believe. You trust in him with your whole heart. And then you are given justification. You are given the righteousness of Christ. You are given your rest. And so we worship God. By resting in the work of Christ. You following me? You picking up what I'm putting down? And so now what do we do with the Sabbath? Well again, there's still wisdom in resting, is there not? There's still wisdom in working. We are still to work throughout our lives, work to provide. But we do not work for our own salvation. And of course, we recognize the other purpose of the Sabbath, which is what? To commune with God. And that's what we're doing here today. That's why we gather on Sunday. That's why this is important. It's because we are gathered here to recognize how Christ has brought to us salvation. We are gathered here to commune with God. That's why when we remember the Lord's Supper, or excuse me, when we take the Lord's Supper, we are remembering how God has brought this communion with us, which is why we call it the name... Communion. So should we, do we have to absolutely rest? No. But if you find yourself wanting to work, ask yourself why. Why am I working today rather than communing with God? This is the day that God's people gather to worship, to commune with God. What's more important to me that I cannot do that? And we recognize the original purpose again. A reminder of creation, of celebration of God's creation. A reminder of how we had lost that through sin. And a pointing to our true rest, which is in Jesus Christ. He is Lord of the Sabbath. He is our rest. So rest in Him. Trust not in yourself. Trust not in your own righteousness but rest in the work of Christ. The Lord of the Sabbath. Let us pray.